chapter 5 have taqwa concerning women. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, women are married for four reasons. Her wealth, her lineage, her beauty, or her religion. So marry the woman for her religion or you will be a loser. The last sentence of this hadith is often conveniently overlooked. So marry the woman for her religion or you will be a loser. In other words, if you marry a woman solely for her beauty, lineage, or wealth, and pay little to no attention to her religion, you will be a loser. This warning needs to be taken heed to. Sheikh Sali al-Fawzan, Hafizahullah, said, The Prophet Sallallahu made clear the criteria by which man would establish a life partner. Then he gave a command by placing the religion as the first criteria. In fact, some of the people have placed the greatest importance on beauty, and man is diverse in his description of beauty, and some of them have put wealth first, making it the important criteria whether it is endowed and inherited or earned. And some of them have made honorable lineage and her family attachments the main criteria. However, the most significant criteria in according to the Sharia is her religion. Indeed, the one who chooses the religious woman has saved himself from a tremendous struggle and effort. And this passage was taken from My Home, My Path, page 135. The misunderstanding and misapplication of the above-mentioned hadith has led many Muslims in prison to a state of loss. In prison, men are starving for intimacy and companionship. This state of depravity causes them to make hasty and unintelligent decisions regarding women. Prisoners are often willing to settle for any woman who is available. As a result, women are married for a fifth reason that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not mention. That is, availability. This especially applies to places like New York, where a family reunion program, otherwise known as trailer visits, is offered for married inmates. I advise my incarcerated brothers with one word, supper, patience. Now before you slam the book shut and declare me to be impractical, hear me out. I am not advocating that you stay single, although that would be better for many of us who are in prison. I am calling you to remain patient while you are single. There is a major difference between the two. Hastiness comes from shaitan as was stated by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hastiness will cause you to be ensnared in a living nightmare of a relationship that will cause you to lose your way behind these walls. So let's review what patience is and then compare that to hastiness as it applies to our situation and this topic. The scholars define patience as devoting oneself to obedience to Allah while refraining oneself from acts of disobedience to Allah, all while avoiding discontent or displeasure with what he has decreed. It also consists of refraining the tongue from complaining, refraining the limbs from acting out, and refraining the heart from being discontent with the decree of Allah. The opposite, the opposite of patience is hastiness. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam clearly stated hastiness comes from shaitan. So what are some examples of hastiness as it applies to our situation? One, constantly badgering others to hook you up with a woman with statements like you got a girl for me tell your wife that i need a friend and other such foolishness that muslims have become far too comfortable with uttering two a willingness to enter into illicit relationships with the supposed intention of turning a haram situation into one that is halal or as we like to say we are giving dawah to the woman who are we trying to fool ourselves or allah Three, reaching out to ex-girlfriends from our days of ignorance, trying to rekindle an old flame by flinging ourselves headfirst into a flame that is fueled by men and stones. Four, meeting women through internet sites with the intentions of maintaining communication without going through a woman's guardian. So what would patience look like? One, supplicating to Allah to bring a Muslima into your life. And two, following up your supplication with taqwa. As Allah says, and whoever has taqwa of Allah, he will make a way out from him, for him from every difficult situation. And he will provide for him from resources he never imagined. Surah Talaq, Ayahs 2-3. It may be that due to your patience and obedience to Allah, 
he was on the verge of rewarding you with a Muslima. However, you lost patience in the last instant and rushed into a situation that is unproductive and the fruits that it will bear will be sweet at first, yet will quickly turn bitter. Thus you will understand the meaning of the term bittersweet. I have noticed that when a brother focuses on learning his religion and rectifying his character, when he is constant in his acts of ibadah, this brother is often approached by another brother asking him if he would like to meet his daughter, sister, mother, aunt, or niece for a prospective marriage. These situations are usually the ones that last and the net month blessing contained in them can be easily observed. I also would like to clarify that the majority of the brothers in prison should not be entrusted with a woman as they do not yet understand how to fulfill the rights of a wife. That being said, there are a handful of exceptions to that general rule in every prison. To my fellow incarcerated Muslims, if you are not diligent in learning your religion, you are not ready for a woman. Again, if you are not diligent in learning your religion, you are not ready for a woman. We turn back to the general menhaj and apply it specifically. That menhaj is knowledge precedes statements in action. Without knowledge, what will you say and do with a woman? you will revert back to practices that were implemented in your days of ignorance. If you have no foundation to stand on, you will be led by emotions and those emotional decisions will cause injustice to occur. Oh, my fellow prisoners, women are a fitna. Women are a fitna. The message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, have taqwa concerning women. Surely the first fitna of Bani Israel was with regards to women. That's collected by Sahih Muslim. Commenting on this hadith, Sheikh Sa'adi Rahimahullah said, Surely their fitna is a grave matter. The things that occur with regard to them are serious and their harms are significant. They are a trap set by the shaitan. This is taken from Bahajat al Qurub al Ibrar, page 348. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, you believe verily among your wives and your children, there are enemies for you, therefore be aware of them. This is Surah Ta- Taghabun, Ayat 14. This is a clear warning. What would make them an enemy? If they turned you from the remembrance of Allah, if they encouraged disobedience of Allah, how many men have claimed to be the imams of their families but turned over the reins of control to their women? Instead of her seeking permission, it is him seeking permission. Instead of her receiving expenditures, it is him receiving expenditures. She makes the decisions. She is the one who is feared. This type of situation opposes the fitra, natural disposition, and causes resentment to creep in. How many men commit shirk by loving their women equally to or more than Allah, and refuge is sought with Allah from that? Allah says, and of mankind are some who take others besides Allah as rivals. They love them as they love Allah. But those who believe love Allah more than anything else. The Surah Al-Baqarah, I have 165. Pay close attention to the words of Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah in his essay on servitude. He said, If a man's heart becomes attached to a woman, even if it is a woman who is lawful for him, his heart will remain captive to her. She will rule him and manage him in any way she sees fit. On her surface, he is her master because he is her husband or owner, but in reality, he is her captive and is owned by her. This condition holds even more so if she is aware of his need for her, his passion for her, and that he views her as irreplaceable. In such circumstances, she rules him in the manner of a forceful and oppressive master rules his subjective, subjugated slave, who is unable to deliver himself from his master. In fact, this condition of a man attached to a woman in such a way is much more severe than the analogy put forward because the captivity of the heart is more serious than the captivity of the body and the enslavement of the heart is more severe than the enslavement of the body indeed one whose body is enslaved and captured does not care as much as long as his heart is at ease and is appeased in fact he may even be able to employ some stratagem to liberate himself however if the heart which is the king of the limbs is taken captive enslaved and holds the greatest type of love for other than Allah this is pure subservience and captivity, and it is a servile obudi, a servitude of what the heart has been enslaved by. End of quote. 
all my fellow brothers are the struggle. Women are a distraction. And if you have become enamored with a woman without taqwa, she is more than a distraction. She is destruction. She will destroy your religion. If you have a woman with taqwa, although she has a benefit, she will still distract you to some degree. In this case, blame is not to be placed on the woman for being a distraction. Rather, blame is placed on the man who is not ready for such a caliber of woman. If a person of desires, whose heart is already corrupt, is given an abundance of money, that money cannot be expected to rectify the corruption in his heart. Rather, money will be a means to his destruction. Similarly, if the same type of person is given a woman, she cannot be expected to rectify his heart. Rather, the most likely scenario is that she will also be a means to his destruction. It is up to the man to display moru'a, manhood, and take control of himself and his woman. This can only be accomplished if knowledge is sought prior to obtaining a woman. In that case, he will be able to act upon that knowledge that he has already attained and call his wife to what is correct. Then he will be able to return to the guidance when marital discord occurs that requires his patience. Footnote. Notice the menhaj that was pointed out by Sheikh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab rahimahullah in his Talatul Tulusul, which he derived from Surah al-Asr. We are obligated to follow this pure menhaj in all endeavors. Take heed to the sequential order, which is, one, gaining knowledge, two, acting upon that knowledge, three, calling to it, four, remaining patient upon the harms that come with it. Back to the main text. Otherwise, a man will either commit injustice and oppression, which is in essence to place things outside of their appropriate place, since our corrupt culture cultivates men to oppress their women. Or he will be willing to compromise in a religion while wrongly assuming that this compromise is hikmah, wisdom, when in fact it is a type of form, injustice. In fact, in that case, the fruit of his compromise will become a source of regret, just as our father regretted the fruit that he was duped into tasting in the Jannah. I would tell you a true story of a young brother who became serious in seeking knowledge and focused on putting that knowledge into practice. As a result, he experienced a state of bliss that was previously unknown. When he abandoned indulging in some of the sins that his lower desires were inclined toward, like music, pictures, using cigarettes as currency, for example, Allah replaced those desires with a firmness in a religion as well as a stronger memory and ability to retain knowledge. Thus he experienced firsthand the truthfulness of what Waqi ibn al-Jarrah, rahimahullah, told his student Imam Shafi, rahimahullah. When Imam Shafi complained of his memory, Waqi told him to leave off sinning, since knowledge is from the light of Allah, and Allah will not shed his light on a sinner. One day, while the brother was in the yard, another brother, whom he was familiar with, began to speak about his desire for a woman. He was basically fantasizing. The brother noticed that this was his favorite topic when they were together. He tried explaining to him the futility of sitting around talking about women all the time since this was not the habit of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions. He also warned him of the dangers of arousing the desires that cannot be appeased at the moment. This is how that conversation went. Misguided brother, you act like you don't want a wife. Striving brother, of course. I want a wife like any other man, but what can I do about it in my current situation? Tell me how does a Muslim in prison acquire a wife? Misguided brother, you can put an ad on the internet on one of those pen pal websites. Striving brother, so you are telling me that I should go and take a picture, write a bio, and allow a woman to contact me without going through her wali, her legal guardian. Misguided brother, how else can we find a wife? Striving brother, we can be patient and focus on learning our religion and getting close to Allah until he makes a way out for us from our difficulty and presents an opportunity to us that doesn't involve sin. Misguided brother, Allah knows our situation. Striving brother, if we compromise the religion in this way, we will be following the path of the Jews who went astray. Within a year of that conversation, the striving brother was approached by another brother who mentioned that his younger sister had recently embraced his slab and he would like him to marry her. He gave him permission to write her. He then wrote her a long letter and the next week she came with her mother to visit him and her brother. This was conducive since her brother was her wali. Alhamdulillah, 
She was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen give her up in a hijab. At the end of the visit, she asked her brother if she could hug him, and he told her, not until you were married. <clears throat> a week later, a marriage contract was put together, signed in front of two witnesses, and sent in the mail for her to sign. Allah brought him a beautiful wife without him compromising his religion to get her. However, since this is no fairy tale or romance novel, I must discuss how the young brother squandered that blessing from Allah. As a new Shahada, his wife still had many traits of jahiliya, ignorance. Although they began to study together on the visits, he slowly began to compromise. First, he began to take pictures with her, something that he was previously against. She didn't understand his initial refusal to take pictures and didn't comprehend the severity of the matter. Although she never pressed the issue, she did a lot of hinting and suggestion. A man naturally wants to please his wife. That natural urge intensifies when the circumstances are of a nature that places limits on the manners in which he can please her. In other words, a man in prison has to figure out ways to make up for the things that he can't provide a woman. Thus, the justification process begins. Then his wife experienced some financial hardship. When they got married, she understood and accepted that he could not fulfill his obligation to take care of her financially. However, he felt emasculated when hearing that this woman complain about money and having no solution to the problems. So his next compromise, again without her insistence, was that he began to buy and trade various items for the cigarettes, and then he would turn the cigarettes into cash to help support her. Although his business ventures were not haram, the currency was haram. This activity also took away from his pursuit of knowledge. Once they began to go on trailer visits, he would also compromise in the area of music. This was done to appease her. Music is a heavily emphasized aspect of the African-American culture. Most of us were raised in an environment full of music. So once we begin to indulge, our hearts easily incline back towards our original cultivation. All of these sins beget more sins until one day, the brother looked up and realized that a major reversion had taken place in his religion and character. As such, much of the light that Allah had previously bestowed on him was gradually dimmed until he could hardly recognize his flicker. I relate his story to warn my brothers of the reality of the Prophet ﷺ statement. The example of righteous company and evil company is like the example of a seller of musk and a blacksmith. So the seller of musk will either give you a gift of musk or you will purchase some from him or you will obtain a pleasant smell from him. The blacksmith will either burn your clothes or leave you with a bad odor. Also, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a man is on the religion of his close companion. So be careful of who you take as a companion. I wouldn't classify the above mentioned brother's wife as evil. Rather, she was ignorant and ignorance begets evil conduct. Thus, that ignorance and close companionship naturally affected him. Sadly, we often fool ourselves into thinking that we are exceptions to the hadith that are warnings of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, Say, I believe in Allah, then stand firm upon that. The brother's wavering approach to his relationship opened the door to deterioration. Ironically, he compromised in an attempt to appease his wife out of fear of losing her. Yet it was that compromise that caused both of their religions to suffer and their marriage deteriorated anyway. Then what he feared most came to fruition. Had he stood firm upon his religion, perhaps Allah would have preserved the foundation that their marriage was originally laid upon. The deterioration of a marriage, such as the one mentioned above, is usually a slow and gradual process. However, alhamdulillah, even in such unfortunate circumstances, there are many lessons to be learned. We often think that the woman is not ready for a relationship in prison. That may be true in many instances. However, it is often the prisoner himself who is not ready to be in a healthy Islamic marriage. This is a re reality that most men refuse to accept. The best of us will lose our minds and our religion once a woman is involved. And Allah knows best. O oh Allah, rectify our religion for us, which is the source of our security. Rectify our worldly affairs for us, which is our livelihood. Rectify our hereafter for us, which is the place of our return. Make our lives a means of increase for everything that is good, and make our deaths a source of relief from every evil.